welcome. This is the data stage, and we have a track here um, called Strategy and Organization. I will kick it off with a more strategic topic on decision automation. I think one of the most interesting and challenging uh, topics that's right now happening in companies. And I would like to present to you a, a framework that helps to structure it and helps to, to work with this topic. And then we will continue with two organizational um, presentations. I think it will be super interesting to see. One will be from Deutsche Bahn, so a very old, very traditional company, talking about their more or less transformation, how they organize themselves. And then the second one will be from Idealo. That's a price comparison uh, website. So a, a modern player, a data only, a digital or web player, also talking about how they set up their organization, what they experience, and, and how they basically make the whole topic of data science work. So this is the track in this room for the next 90 minutes. Let's kick it off. Decision automation. So we as an analyst company, Bark is an analyst company, we are often involved in strategic uh, discussions, meaning that we work with companies on how to basically achieve certain uh, goals in digitalization, how to come up with uh, strategies that actually work. So basically the level below the, the very general digital strategy, then we have to talk about data, we have to talk about analytics, about skills and teams and organization and technology and so on. And these are topics we are concerned with whenever you need a, a neutral independent body that's not interested in selling software or services in terms of implementation and so on. And now the topic of decision automation, I think is, is really key to understand in the digital transformation. And I would like to pick up one topic that I think was rule number nine in the keynote, basically AI first, because this is the driver for, for most things. And I just want to highlight one, obviously one of the digital companies that made it very prominent. Um, this is Sundar Pichai, the, the um, CEO of Google. And they very prominently announced about a year ago now that they really totally changed the way they approached their software development, they, or their, the overall approach to their products. And he said, uh, we, we are right now in the transition from mobile first to AI first, and maybe to, to hear him out, I think it's quite clear what they are up to. As of this week, we crossed over 2 billion active devices of Android. And this is all because of the growth of mobile and smartphones. But computing is evolving again. We spoke last year about this important shift in computing from a mobile first to an AI first approach. Mobile made us reimagine every product we were working on. We had to take into account that the user interaction model had fundamentally changed with multi touch, location, identity, payments, and so on. Similarly, in an AI-first world, we are rethinking all our products and applying machine learning and AI to solve user problems. And we are doing this across every one of our products. So today, if you use Google Search, we rank differently using machine learning. Or if you're using Google Maps, Street View automatically recognizes restaurant signs, street signs, using machine learning. And Smart Reply in Allo last year had great reception. And so today, we are excited that we are rolling out Smart Reply to over 1 billion users of Gmail. It works really well. Here's a sample email. If you get an email like this, the machine learning systems learn to be conversational, and it can reply, I'm fine with Saturday or whatever. So it's really nice to see. So I think what's really impressive is they said, okay, we have 2 billion users of Android. I mean, that's quite impressive by itself. But then you said, but that's the old world. That was the mobile world. And now we are transforming into an AI world. So even such an uh, innovative company basically is understanding that they need to move again. And maybe to pin it down, what does it actually mean is, first of all, rethinking all products and applying machine learning and AI to all processes. I think that's basically the imperative. That's basically what every single company has to do, not only a, a web player or a digital player, but basically every single company. And this is what AI first means. Then we have the change in the user interaction paradigm to really rethink again how users are interacting with us as a company uh, in whatever form. 
Then we have to think about big data use cases, because making AI work is really about having data. And then there is an availability of deep learning function uh, frameworks that can you, you can make use or AI services. So what I, I want to say here is it gets really easier to use it. So there's now a lot available, ready for use, that you don't have to rebuild. And um, there, are, there are these players that are really looking to provide these services and also often they even build optimized hardware for that. So AI first has having implications everywhere, on hardware, on cloud computing, on the use cases, but the fundamental idea is basically rethinking the products and processes. And what it in the end means is we are right now starting the next wave of automation. So we have been in a in a big automation wave for the last, let's say, about 100 years. But now it's really the next wave we are in going into. And one piece of that for sure is decision automation. And maybe that's even the, the single <coughs> most interesting new piece that we can do. Um, because here suddenly we take a, a purely human feature, making a decision, like getting all the data input and then making a decision. And we are moving that now to machines. And that's in a bit threatening, but it's basically the automation that's happening. And what we we'll propose is um, a model quite similar to what you might know from the autonomous driving. Right now, autonomous cars are classified, or our cars are classified, on what level of autonomy they actually uh, can achieve. And being in Munich and having so many also car manufacturers speaking at this company or participating in it, I think it's a good match to also think about decision autonomy, decision making autonomy also in five levels because it's basically the, the same idea. And just to give you a quick overview on these five levels, and I think it's the path to decision automation for many companies at the same time. If you look at level one, it's really a human decision but data supported. And we did this with business intelligence technologies now for about 20 to 30 years in companies to really try to improve that. So we improved reporting, we added dashboarding, ad hoc analysis evolved to much more self-service today. We did that also in planning processes and so on. But it's basically a human taking a decision, but having tools to support delivering data to that person, hopefully to make a more informed decision. Second level would be now a model-supported human decision. So here we take analytics to the next level and say, okay, it's not about simple data delivery, simple things like uh, aggregation, like grouping, like making a sum or an average or whatever, but it's really about building models. And that's what many data scientists obviously do today. But I would call it data mining. That's something we do also for 30, 40 years. Um, and we can use it in, in forecasting, in customer scoring, and so on. So use cases that have been around for, again, 20, 30 years, at least the early movers have done it. They have often struggled, obviously, with not enough data available, not enough processing power available. That, but this is what we have today. We are now generating lots of data. We have this processing power available. So now it's really time to, to do it. But it's not so super new. And it's only level two in a quest or in, an, in a journey to automation. If you look at BI, and that's basically still BI in a way, it has uh, um, evolved here. So basically reporting is still done today. It's not going away, even though many call it like really the old stuff, but we still need it today. And also analysis is basically coming from the 90s and the concepts that have been developed there, for example, in memory computing, OLAP analysis was always in memory computing, by the way. So also old concepts still in use today. But then advanced analytics, what we basically talk about today a lot, um, is also quite an old concept. So the, the uh, fundamental work in data mining algorithms has been done in the 90s. And what is used a lot, obviously, is statistics that's way, way older. And the, the fundamental work in neural networks, for example, has been done in the 1960s. So, it's even, so we're using a lot of quite uh, established old ideas, but brought it into the field of decision making. And advanced analytics also is now around for quite some time. Then planning and forecasting also came into the game around the year 2000, also be understood as part of the, uh, at the business intelligence, meaning how to support a decision maker in making decisions. 
what has been added then is not a functional capability, but BI has been operationalized. So meaning it got much closer to the operational processes. And in a way, this is right now the step that we need for data science. Because as we said in the keynote, data science is right now struggling in this operationalization. It's coming out of the lab and suddenly all the problems appear. And BI has been in that stage um, and about 10 years now, maybe five years in some companies, uh, we are trying to get more operational, so trying to, to be closer to the process. For example, adding to a monitoring, process monitoring to reporting and so on. So lots of examples. And what we do today, um, the last stage is AI supported BI. So we are adding now in every single functional area, we're adding AI capabilities, meaning reporting the old stuff still very um, st very much needed and what's what's very new today is for example NLG natural language generation so using AI not only to understand a user like a new user interface so you can now basically dictate or ask whatever Alexa about the latest numbers about the latest reports and so on but it also goes back so we have now systems uh, new systems in the market that write the report in natural language that basically explain what is in the numbers, what used to be a human uh, area and only a human could do, that's already automated now. We see that in every single functional area and this is basically the involvement of BI that we see where AI supports it. But going back to the model, it's really level one and two. So it's all about a human decision maker supporting the human decision maker. And this is only obviously partly automated. And now level three comes into play. Now we start to automate decisions because once these models we have built are working and we build up trust in them, then we let them do their job. And basically the human role is going back. It's not about the actual decision anymore. The human role is now to build the model, to evaluate it, to make sure it's still uh, appropriate, um, that it's fitting to the uh, data to the use case to the process and so on but the actual decision now at level three that's a bit of a tipping point into automation is um, using machine learning to basically hand over the decision to a, a model so we see that in campaign planning recommendation engines and so on so most of these examples here are working without human intervention but they're making decisions this example has been shown so basically here, even in, in natural language, um, this human being that now has a decision to take, you get a question by email, you want to take a decision, and basically the, uh, the machine here supports in a simple way, at least you don't have to type your decision, but you are doing the decision. Or this example is also like augmenting a human being, the human is still the decision maker, but now it's augmented, meaning a model is supporting him. And I found this always quite interesting. Let's see whether this works. Yes. Did you hear that sound? Dee -dee -dee -dee. If you're driving a Tesla and hearing that sound, you know you're in trouble. Because that sound is the collision warning, meaning there's an immediate collision upcoming. That's what the algorithm, the model, has detected. And I show you a, a great example, I think, where this um, has been shown. That's a, a dash cam, so someone driving on the highway. And the car says, the model, basically, the model calculating whether you are in a near crash, says, uh, well, better watch out. So we have a human decision maker on the steering wheel. And now the, the car, the machine, is telling him um, something's happening. So what do you think if you see the picture? Hmm. Maybe you're wrong again. Huh? <laughs> so some, do I trust the machine or not? This is the big question here. So let's see uh, the, the full video. Okay. Yeah. It was right. But what we could see is, um, maybe we can run it again, but what you can see is that the machine here is actually superior. Why is that? So how could a collision warning tell you that something's happening when the distance even to the car in front of you didn't change at all? This, this, from a human perception, this would be something where I would say, okay, suddenly it gets closer, then there is a collision coming. But this, uh, this algorithm, this model, is, is having more data, basically. 
because it's based on radar, not only on, on visual, on vision. And basically, it has to calculate also the distance between the car in front of you and the car in front of that car, because that's where the collision actually happened, and then you are moving into it. Let's see whether we can go back on the slide and run it again. And see how, f how early on this actually happens. I would say it's about one to two seconds before the actual crash happened that the collision warning went up. Um, so I think a quite an impressive example. So the machine can actually work with more data, not only the vision that you have, but basically more information, uh, can then calculate it quite quickly, as we've seen, maybe one or two seconds before the actual crash happened, it already warned the driver. And then, then the driver actually reported here, the car actually started to brake, which is exactly the, the crossing point between does the human still have control or is the machine taking over? In this case, basically the machine decided maybe I should take over at this time because if the, the driver is asleep or something, then I better stop the car at this point before crashing into the accident here. But this is what we call level three. It's human controlled, so the human is on the steering wheel. The model is supporting that. Um, there are already automated decisions like the braking of the car, but immediately the human could still have basically hit the gas pedal, for example. If maybe the, the human decision would have been maybe not braking is the right thing to do, but maybe driving around the accident or whatever. So you can still have a, um, a human basically control what's happening. So we call that uh, partial autonomy. The degree of automation is suddenly increasing, and this is level three is basically the tipping point. Um, so here you're really giving away um, the decision power to a model or an algorithm and basically to a machine in the end. But this is not it. Level four. These are then really autonomous de decision models. So here we put basically the human being in brackets. Um, so some use cases here. Typically what we observe is that the, um, the actual technical implementation is typically based on machine learning plus optimization. So meaning we, we add the context to the actual problem. So often in machine learning we solve a very specific problem, like we come up with a figure, a forecast, a prediction, a classification, whatever. But when we embed that um, into the context, basically in a real decision model, um, then we often use optimization technologies because then we cannot have a singular problem solved. We have to solve it in a context of many different possible actions and possible outcomes. And this, is, I think, is the core uh, of what's happening here. And just to, to give some examples, dynamic pricing today in an in a e-commerce uh, environment, no human intervention at all. And it's not even possible because the amount of data uh, to be processed and the speed of the decision is basically, um, it cannot be done by humans anymore. So there are interesting studies out there um, that, for example, Amazon is one of the, the market, or maybe the market leading e-commerce retailer, obviously. Um, there are some days they are changing prices for a single product more than 70 times. So it's really basically jumping around and it's based a lot of internal data like uh, stock and, and traffic on the website. And, but it's increasingly also being influenced by external data, especially the pricing of the competition, obviously. So you see, okay, how do I want my competitive pricing? Do I want to be a bit cheaper? Maybe it's okay for me to be a bit more expensive. And what's really now happening or has to happen at some point is now the personalized pricing, obviously. And especially in Germany, everyone's very sensitive about it but not even in, not only in Germany, but things uh, people say, well, but this is really unfair. Yeah? Why does my neighbor sitting next to me can pay a, a cheaper price than me? Isn't that really unfair? So people, now it gets into psychology and dynamic pricing, but obviously this is the next step. First you start to, to look what data is available uh, on the market, but in the end you will try to have prices individualized for people. And how is it done today? It's done today already even if every one of you gets the same price. So it's another psychological trick. How is it played? Very simple. Every one of you gets a different rebate. So suddenly you have individualized pricing with the same price on the website for everyone. So this is basically how we get behind it. But the actual decision 
is being done uh, by a machine, what price to take. Already two, three years ago, we give out a best practice award every year. Two, three years ago, we gave it to Otto, the German uh, e-commerce retailer, and they really explained their journey and basically said, well, we had to um, change the jobs of all category managers we had because simply they, they were the ones that were setting the prices, but they, we had to replace them by algorithms, by machines, by models, because simply we have uh, more than one million products on, across our web shops, and if we want to keep up with Amazon, there's no way that a human being can start to, to make prices because they have to react obviously to what's happening with the competition and that's uh, as I said for some products especially for example in electronics 70 price changes a day no way a human being can monitor or a group of human beings can monitor a million products for price changes and then come up with a optimal price even they might have to calculate so that I think is a good example where humans basically get out of the equation because they're too slow and basically can't handle it another good example and this is even maybe on the edge to level five is uh, algorithmic high frequency trading so what's happening on the stock markets and there's actually not a lot of data available so you see it's quite old here 2014 even data from 2012 but um, this is uh, measuring basically how uh, many trades or how many transactions on that market are actually done by machines. Um, and you see what's happening, it's rising uh, depending on the market um, and the, the uh, prediction is obviously will be more and more. And here I think we see some very interesting effects happening coming back to our model here because this is now on the edge of level 5 where the human is completely out of the equation. Meaning here we have uh, self-learning and interactive cognitive systems, I would call it. So on the on the stock market, I would say it's still limited to a very specific use case. That's why I would say it's still level four. But anyway, what's happening there is because it's the, the algorithmic trading is quite an, an old discipline now. So basically all professional traders are quite optimized already. So they know pretty well how a certain trading strategy is being implemented in, in algorithms, so how they can do that. And what's really now happening is the interactive part, and now it gets really interesting. So now the successful algorithms have to take into account what the other algorithms on the market will be doing or might be doing as a reaction to what this algorithm is doing. So if somebody starts to buy, obviously the price will change, and then the question is what will the other algorithms do on that market? So it starts to be a, become a, a game in a way that uh, not only the best algorithm for a specific task will win in the end, but the, the best algorithm that can also basically think about or maybe observe what other algorithms will do on the marketplace. And now we're starting to, to come into an interactive game where uh, basically algorithms are battling each other about the best decision to take, when to buy and when to sell. That's a basic decision in a market. And um, now the human is really completely out of the loop because it's really anticipating other machines' behavior. And I think this is giving a bit of an outlook. So is it far-fetched? Is it completely out of the, uh, of the range of any thinking of any companies? No. This is the reality where we will all end up with. The big question is only when. But I'm, I'm very, very convinced that this is where we end this journey, that we're starting right here with simple data science projects on simple use cases in a small data lab. But this is the effect we have to take. We have to automate decision. This is, from a strategic standpoint, the next wave of automation. We will enter into a company. So we, and that's our, um, our message is basically we better start also strategically to think about it and how to manage that and not just let it happen because typically we see in markets that the companies that manage that, that have a plan, that know what they are doing are more successful in the end. So what's happening, just as a summary, control is handed over to a machine between level uh, 1 and level 5. The decision speed is massively increasing so we're talking about uh, microseconds, maybe even less, um, where decisions can be taken. And the data usage is massively increasing um, together with the analytical complexity. So we can do things, um, we can use data in a way that the human being cannot. Um, so all the dependencies, all the developments, the time series and so on, at some point a human being is not uh, able to cope with that anymore. 
but the uh, data science algorithms or models we see obviously typically can. I will not get into the discussion now what's the role of the human being, and there is a role for sure, yeah, because there are still some things that these machines cannot do, but right here, talking about business processes, this for sure is the way if we create more and more data, we need to analyze it and we need to have this. By the way, you get the slides. I see all your taking pictures. Um, of course, we uh, provide the slides very soon after the conference. So that's five levels of decision automation. And I want to end this the last five minutes. Um, I want to also talk a bit about the challenges, because obviously um, this provides a framework how to, to work. But um, what are the challenges we have to cope with? And I just want to pick out two. There are many more, for sure. But I want to pick out two. One is the topic of accountability. So what happens if we hand over decision-making power to machines? And the one topic is accountability. And that's also called the black box problem. And basically, a lot of decision models we will build here will be black boxes. Um, especially if you use like neural networks or technologies like that. And you can say, well, who cares, as long as it works. Well, it care, we should care, because there can be some serious decisions affecting human beings uh, being made by more and more uh, black box models. And we already see the first wave of a counter reaction to that, that people say, no, we don't want that, and it's even now in, in the legislation. And especially uh, neural networks are a very good example. I found this picture great. It gives an, a topology uh, overview, basically. Um, so we are investing a lot in deep learning. It, it's basically the en vogue technology of the day. But be very sure, it's a black box, uh, what we create here. And we should be very aware that in, in some use cases, we cannot use it or we will not be able to use it. And legislation is right now starting to make sure of that. So maybe the coolest things we could do in data science are the ones that will be forbidden in the future because we are creating black boxes. So what's the problem of a, of a black box, of the decision that it makes? Yeah, you have to believe. That's all you can do because you cannot really... Um, you cannot really look into it how a decision has been done. Best example, obviously GDPR. Uh, Alex Borg just said it's a great uh, chance. I totally agree. Um, but here there are some very specific um, uh, regulations in there. For example, there are some, uh, some parts of it dealing explicitly with uh, algorithmic decision making. That's, if you want to look it up, that's Article 26 and 27. So um, it really says there is a right to explanation. So that's one of the fundamental rights that GDPR imposes. And it says um, that a company has to provide meaningful information about the logic involved when it uses automated decision making. And now the big battle amongst the, the lawmakers and everyone is starting, so what does that mean? What is meaningful information? But for sure, one thing is for sure, it does not mean you say, oh, it's a black box, I have no idea. You have just got your input values and the neural net said you are not getting that uh, loan. Sorry, this will not be the answer. So there needs to be a meaningful information. Interestingly, there's also a right uh, in GDPR that a human is involved in decision making. So you as a customer can go to the company and say, I'm not accepting your, your loan, credit, verdict, whatever. Um, I want a human involved. So now you as a company, you have to start thinking about automating more and more decision, but having a, like a, a backdoor. If someone comes and said, I want a human making this decision for me, not the decision model, uh, they actually have a right if personal data is involved, which is GDPR is about. So there's already starting um, the topic of accountability and it's already starting to be reflected in uh, legislation. Second uh, challenge I would like to mention very quickly, black box. Now there's a white problem, that's the so-called white guy problem, that's the bias in decision making. You're, most of you, I think, have heard about it, just to give you uh, some examples. It's basically uh, example one is voice recognition, and it uh, obviously has been trained only by um, by uh, males, because those were the developers or whatever, so they had to struggle to, to uh, recognize female voices. Or we all know this pre-crime prediction, crime prediction, that's typically then uh, discriminating against a race or color. 
or we have uh, the problem of this job ad platform that basically learned the parameters of uh, executives. And then the inference was, well, it had to be mid-aged white males in a certain industry because these are all the executives that are there. So then we show the job ads for new executives, obviously only to white mid-aged males, which is obviously again discriminating. So the bias problem is coming from training data. Very obvious. But now this is coming down to a topic of, of data ethics. Um, which will be become very, very uh, interesting, I think, in the future, because now we have to implement ethics in algorithms and models. And this will, who will do that? It will be the duty of the data scientists, the people that actually train the models and build the models. So we, we see this as a new paradigm, a new imperative also to make sure that uh, things like a bias is actually excluded and it's not in. But these are effects of automated decision making. We have to make sure that, for example, uh, the, the ethics we would like to employ in our decision making is actually also in the algorithms or in the models we have. We have a session on that tomorrow at uh, 11 o'clock on this stage. So if you are more interested in this specific topic, uh, welcome to join me. So. To finish this up, I think it's important to manage the journey to automated decision making. Um, the, the framework here might help to categorize where am I, where should I be. I think it's, it's important to do that for every process. I think it's also too important to think about how to achieve uh, a certain level in a certain process. And you have to talk about data, about skills, about organization, about technology, about use cases. So it's not, not very simple, obviously, but it can be done. It's a typical strategic uh, set of questions. And then you need a roadmap. Uh, looking at competition, looking at your customers, looking also at your employees, what can you achieve and, and how can you move ahead. But I'm, for one thing, I think it's very sure you have to move and I hope this can help you. So that's uh, as a starting point the, the thinking we have around decision automation. We put out a, a so-called leader circle, so if you're interested in discussing that with your peers, um, you're very welcome to, to do that. We create these forums. Please contact me if you're interested in that. And with that, I thank you for the first part of this session.